Okay, well, here we are in Bury, and I'm joined on Talking Pints by Big Ron Atkinson. Ron, welcome to the programme. Well, clearly, Ron Atkinson, really rather popular in the Greater Manchester area. I wonder why we'll come to that in a moment. Now, Ron, as a footballer, you were known as the tank. Was this because of your, was this because of your subtle style? A mate of mine said it's because I couldn't turn quickly in the sand. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, uh, I think it was something to do with the way I played. Right, yeah. Aggressive. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that surprises me. It really does. <laughs> <laughs> right, what do you think about it? You know, the career of a professional footballer. It's a very short period of your life, really, isn't it? It is, um, but, you know, I said I left school at 15. Yep. I've never worked since. You know, because, <laughs> you know, I had a way of life that I've enjoyed doing. It hasn't been a chore to have to get up and think, oh, I haven't got to go and do that again today, have I? Now, and you made that transition into being a manager and a successful manager, and I think we kind of know what the attributes are of a good player, but what is it that makes a good manager? I think basically you've got to have the ability to deal with people. I had two basic principles. One was I would always treat players the way I wanted to be treated as a player. That doesn't mean to say you've got to cut a favour with them. Sometimes you've got to tell them harsh facts. And B... No player could ever play badly for me, providing he was attempting to do the job. He may not have always played well, yeah. but if he was, for argument's sake, say he was a striker and he was missing chances, providing he was still going in there to have a go for them, he'd, he'd put up with it. Not for too long, I might have. <laughs> <laughs> but those are, those are two basic principles. Uh, were you a disciplinarian? To a certain extent, yeah. There's, there's various ways of discipline. Um, I didn't want people coming into to training. I like people to come in with a smile on their face and be enthusiastic and enjoy it. I didn't want to make it like a war of attrition when they came in, which does happen in certain clubs, mm. you know, with managers. Mm. And I would sooner have like an hour and a half or an hour and a quarter high intensity. In fact, one of my coaches once said to me, you're the only coach that doesn't believe in breathers. I wanted everything high tempo from the minute they started till the minute they finished, rather than a couple of hours dragging it out. You know, I wanted it played, oh, trained Done. at a high level yeah. and a high ten yeah, intensity. Now you went on to manage some, you know, great clubs. West Bromwich Albion. You were the first top flight manager to have three black players in the team, which I remember at the time was a really big, yeah. big deal. And, of course, you know, Manchester United, there you are. I mean, one of the biggest football club names in the world. How did that feel? It was great, but you, you've got to go back to the fact, when I actually left West Brom, we actually had a much better side than the side I inherited Man at yeah. Man U. Yeah. I mean, people, because of the success, I mean, I always say, like, Fergie was there 26 years, I was there five years, and, you know, between us, we won something like 50 trophies. The fact that he won 48. <laughs> <laughs> but no, you do yourself down, because you did have FA Cup glory yeah. with Manchester United. You did finish high up in the league. I mean, you, didn't, you didn't have a bad run there, did you? Well, when I, when I went there, I mean, I think from the year... With, they won the European Cup in 68. And I think they'd only qualified um, for Europe about three times in that period. Now, at West Brom, we qualified every year. Yeah. And when I went there, I said to the chairman, Martin Edwards, I said, look, we've got to become a European club again. And we did that every year. We, we were never at the top four. So in that respect, we were all right. What we didn't do, people, I'd only been there three months, and somebody said, you know, we've not won the title for 15 years. I said, I've only been here three months. <laughs> <laughs> and, and but the pressure's was, real, isn't it? Yeah, that was the thing they always, they always brought up, you know, the thing about the, uh, winning the title. And people say to me, well, what was the reason? Why didn't you win this? Because we had a good enough team to win it. Two, two words summed it up. Ian Rush. Because if we'd have had Ian Rush, yeah. we'd have won it every year. Yeah, and Liverpool. Know, yeah. yeah, Liverpool were pretty good at yeah, the time, yeah, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know... You did win, what, five major trophies, managing different yeah. clubs. You had a great managerial career. But when you look at football now, 
and you look, in fact, sport in general. The Saudis do have, really, quite a lot of money. They've effectively bought World Golf. Yeah. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the fallout is going to be yeah. between the PGA Tour and the Live. Uh, but now paying, I mean, you know, transfer money for clubs that are just, I mean, you just can't even believe what the numbers are. Now, Trevor Francis, of course, was the first £1 million pound footballer, yes. wasn't he? Yeah. And a good friend of yours? Yeah. I, in fact, we go back. I actually marked him on his full debut. Right. He was a kid of 16. And because I used to say to Trevor a lot, you only had, you hardly had a kick that you in fact you only had one kick it was the equalizer like <laughs> <laughs> and then uh, ironically enough i was his last manager i signed him at uh, sheffield wednesday to yeah. come and do like a cameo role for us and obviously it was a shock this week when we heard yeah. what what had happened yeah. but uh, he'll be remembered very fondly he'll be he'll be remembered particularly well at forest because of the European goal, he scored the winner. Mm. But in Birmingham, he's, he's probably rated the greatest ever player they've ever had. Yeah, no, great player. Yeah. As I say, you know, a, a sad uh, early demise, yeah. a £1 million player, but now the Saudis, I mean, are the Saudis going to ruin football? I don't know. I really don't know. I, I think it depends how competitive they get in their league. I mean, it's like when the American League first started in the, probably the 60s, 70s, a lot of older players went out there yeah. as the last payday. Yeah. Now, they may well do that. I mean, people are criticising Jordan Henderson today because he's gone out there and he's, he's, uh, he's earning 700 grand a week. Yeah. So this must be a mug to You ate that. too early, I, I, No, <laughs> I wouldn't take a, a cut for anybody. Uh, <laughs> no, but you look at that and think, well, just... And you'll know this better than me. Haven't we been dealing with the Saudis for years, so, so selling them planes and yeah, arms yeah, of course, and things like of course, that? Of course. So why does sport always get singled out when it's something like that, as opposed to the general business world who, who've been dealing with the Saudis for yeah, ages? No, no, I get that. I yeah. just, you know, I just wonder whether, in the end, if there's too much money in sport, it can destroy some of the ethos of it. Well, it could do, but of course, this is where the Italians, this is the Spanish have been worried about our premiership because there's that much money in the premiership yeah, now that they've been, they've been complaining. Mm. But somehow or other they've, they've survived and now there's another challenge from... Where, where I think the Saudis will struggle is they haven't got a competitive enough football league. I mean, it's never going to be compelling vis uh, viewing, is right. it? Unle unless they buy... Everybody. And block Everybody. Manchester City <laughs> yeah. and block them. Well, Manchester yeah. United and block yeah. them. I, I mean, who knows? Who knows? Yeah. Ron, your TV career, you know, great TV career, and then one horrendous moment, you know, a, a scene of foul-mouthed abuse, the N-word, not good. Um, did that feel like the world was about to fall in upon you? Uh, it came, it was, well, I didn't even know it had happened. And no, did anybody else in this country. So it, it happened. Yeah. And, but I got over that, you know. I was, you did, I was, but didn't you? You, I was did, wrong. you did get over it. Yeah, I was wrong. But, uh, it, and it came at a time in my career when, all right, if it had happened earlier, who knows. But it had happened, and so I just I got on with things because I know what I am and I know what, what, I, I'm, what I wasn't supposed to be anyway. And it was a lot, but you, you took some real stick. Well, I did, but I had a lot of people stick up for me as well. Yeah, yeah. A lot from, including, including a lot of footballers and players that you knew. Including a lot of black players. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, exactly, but, exactly. You know, I've moved on from that now, to be fair, Nigel. Yeah, I wonder in the modern world whether you get over it as easily. I think we're more judgmental now than we were then, but you did. And you go hey, on. I was, I was the first. I was uh, the one they set up. I, well, I think you probably were. <laughs> and you went on to do... You know, all sorts of different things on television. Big Brother and goodness. Why did you do all that for? Money. <laughs> <laughs> you see, the point is, you get them on Talking Pies, you give them a drink, and they really will tell you the truth. <laughs> no, you did all those things. Yeah. But you're still and I also made up my mind, I would get, I'd be the most... I'm, considered arguably or easily the most boring person they've ever had on it because I made up my mind I'm going to get out as quick as I can and you and did. did and you did <laughs> and Emma Wilson she'd never seen anybody so happy to get out 
<laughs> yeah, I must have. I've been offered it a few times, and I, thus far, I have managed to resist. Ron, you're still active. You're still busy. You're still getting involved with football, with punditry, with all sorts of different things. Uh, you're sort of person that's never really going to retire, are you? Why? Yeah. In all fairness, and I retire from work because, like I said, it's never been work. It's just been a, way, a great way of life, you know. Um, what I do, I play a lot of golf. Yep. Not, well, I call it golf. Um, <laughs> but, and they keep saying, why don't you go and play with the seniors? Because my golfing group are all young lads, younger mm. lads, like, you know. I say, I'm going to play with all them. They'll, they'll be moaning about their hips and all about that. You know, <laughs> about that. Yeah. Well, Ron, you are, I have to say, pretty irrepressible. You've had an amazing career. You've made an impact on a very large number of people in this country. And it's been an absolute pleasure to have you with a live audience here in Bury this evening. Thank you. Cheers. <laughs>